Hi guys, I'm Shmi. Hello and welcome back to the channel where you join me today in Las Vegas. Just off the strip, you can see the famous New York, New York and some of the strip hotels, Cosmo, Vidara, etc. are behind during the Where's Shmi US Edition Tour, where today I'm here at Vegas Auto Gallery to check this out, a car that is particularly intriguing, the Acura NSX, or over in Europe, the Honda NSX, but one I haven't driven for about four and a half years, and I think this is an underappreciated supercar. It was effectively the first affordable hybrid supercar with the 3.5 litre twin turbocharged V6, along with three electric motors, 581 horsepower, very, very quick, very capable, and very impressive from what I remember of my drive back then. So I cannot wait to get back behind the wheel and think a little bit more about how the NSX is standing up. The second generation NSX, a significant change from that first generation car that's been incredibly popular and still remains to this day. Modern JDM, we could say as well. So we'll go through the car in a little bit of detail. Then with Vegas Auto Gallery, we're gonna be heading out for a drive onto some awesome roads as well. This just looks stunning sitting here. So let's have a look and then let's get out on the road. I must first apologize that it is exceptionally windy here in Las Vegas today, but when we get back from the drive in the NSX, we're also gonna check out the showroom here at Vegas Auto Gallery. They are the Lotus dealer in Las Vegas, but over in the showroom, you can see one of three hypercars, an Annie Teen Spider in some very special company we'll go and see a little bit later. But let's take a look at this then, the NSX looking stunning in this blue paintwork. Also with the carbon fiber contrast, you've got the lip spoiler back here, you've got the carbon fiber roof, but this was a very clever leap in technology back when it launched launched in 2016. A very big change from the previous Acura or Honda NSX, but really bringing hybrid supercar performance in a very easy to use package, combining the three and a half litre twin turbocharged V6, along with a trio of electric motors, two up front, one for each corner, one connected to the combustion engine for a total power output of 581 PS, 573 brake horsepower, and also 476 pounds foot of torque, that's 645 Newton meters. So this goes plenty quick enough, zero to 60 miles an hour, or 100 kilometers an hour in just over three seconds, onto a top speed of 191 miles per hour, 307 kilometers through what is technically an all-wheel drive setup. They call it the SH all-wheel drive system, but basically allowing you to, to daily it. You've got some luggage space back here. You don't have any space up front due to the motors and the way all of that is set up, but a car that I think looks brilliant, it's, it's a bit quirky, it's a bit unusual. There are many things about it that have been very highly engineered. For example, they talk about how thin the A pillars are to help with visibility. You can see the cooling that goes through around the different areas here, the intakes that you have on the rear deck lid, obviously the spoiler worn on the back of this one. And I think those dark gray wheels suit it very nicely as well. Take a look inside the car, just unlock it. Inside here, the steering wheel as well, this flat top, again with carbon fiber, very, very nicely equipped. This car's done, I think about 15, 16,000 miles or so, but still looking totally immaculate. I can't wait actually to get behind the wheel of this and drive it properly, but you can't drive it as an EV. I don't think you can put it in the full electric mode and you don't charge it that way either. It charges the batteries off the combustion engine. So that true hybrid experience, that true hybrid style setup, which is why we're gonna take it out with a particular interest, like I said, because this kind of thing is right up my street. And I remember being mesmerized by it when I did drive it the first time. And I want to see if it lives true to that. They are very, very rare over in Europe. Not many of these about at all. This is the key for the car that we have just here. Driver one, it remembers your settings and things depending which key you have step on board just for a second we'll start this up there we go you can hear the way it fires the engine up off the uh, electric system but here if I turn the dynamic mode selector listen to how much louder it gets and then go back the other way it makes a 25 decibel difference depending on the driving mode all right so I think we need to get set up and in a moment we're going out to find a nice road to drive this thing and maybe even think whether it appeals to me. We are heading out then. We're actually going for a drive with the AMG E63S up ahead. Oh, we've got a Lambo Spider, Hurricane Spider pulling in too at the same time. Always lots of very, very nice cars around here. Now this is the trippy thing, isn't it? When you're driving silently, we're in sport, but it's in the EV mode. And even now you'd think I should get accustomed to these things, but supercars to me have that mentality of they must be making a lot of noise whereas in here if we toggle the dynamic mode selector then we get into sport plus mode then we can hear it a little bit more and you get that raspy v6 <laughs> and it 
feels very nimble and agile. This car disguises its weight very well, which I remember before. It's 1,725 kilos, which is 3,800 pounds. But you wouldn't know it just driving the car. Maybe when you're trying to hurtle it through some corners, you might feel it a little bit more. But driving like this, it's, it's agile, it's nimble, it gets a shuffle on, and of course we can turn it back into sport mode. Rev counter drops to zero, and effectively we are back in EV mode, the car just working all of this out itself and bringing it all into uh, into one package. A very interesting comparison to me about this car is the arrival now of the McLaren Artura, which is of course a 3.0-litre twin-turbo V6 hybrid with electric motors, effectively an affordable hybrid supercar, if we could put it relatively, of course. But this, this was the forerunner, this was really breaking new ground when it arrived back then. Yes, the BMW i8 existed, but that has, well, effectively about half the horsepower of this. And this is more, I think, in a technology standpoint, connected to the Porsche 918 Spyder. And in fact, a lot of people who had worked on that project worked on this project, hence why when you're driving it, you feel lots of similarities in common. He says, as we go past just the crazy hotels on the Strip, Excalibur, MGM, we've got Delano and Mandalay Bay, we've got the new stadium here as well. It is a crazy place to be driving, but instantly in here, it just gives you this daily drive sense to it. And I mean, I'm taking it easy at the moment. If we do go back into Sport Plus and we press the button here to go into manual as well, we can drop some gears and use some of the performance of the car. Wow. Easy to forget that, yes, it's fast. It's very fast, 600 odd horsepower get that V6 noise, you can also hear some of the blow off from the turbos when you lift off as well. Maybe you want it to be a little bit quicker. You need to get out onto the open, onto some countryside roads or mountain twisty roads, which I think is where we're going to be heading very shortly. For the drive, we've come up on a beautiful day to Red Rock Canyon, so we're going to be heading up this way in a moment towards, well, some fairly nice roads with this car. One thing I can't quite work out about it, though, are the door handles and when they choose to open and when they choose to close, which is kind of interesting. But hey, all part of the design. Let's continue. There are definitely a fair few quirks with this car. For example, just everything that's going on with the dashboard. The design is all quite crazy, but also another thing, you notice quite a bit of wind noise coming in from the A-pillars, maybe from the mirrors as well, just outside the car. But overall, it's a really quite fun thing to drive, and I find it very... <laughs> Sorry, a bit of an acceleration. Very interesting to consider that when these came out, they weren't really in immense demand. When they launched, they were underappreciated. I think in the UK, in total, we have less than 100 cars. Obviously over here, a little over 1,000 in the US, of maybe 2,000 or so in total that were actually made. But when you're out on a nice road like this, and you can actually drive it, start to enjoy a little bit of this car, and understand as well what it's up to, for example, the way that it builds up charge. And I mean, I'm in Sport Plus doing the occasional accelerations and we still have effectively full battery because it recharges off the braking. It just happens in the background. You don't have to worry about it. If you do go down into the Sport or even into the quiet mode, it obviously is set up to just operate as it deems best. The exhaust valves are closed, so it's very quiet on the combustion engine when you're in quiet mode. And obviously it can just cut off the engine and run completely on EV depending how it thinks that you're driving at the time. You go back into Sport and it balances it a little bit more. You go back into Sport Plus and we've got manual at the moment with the gearbox. And then it's all, all over to you. And I tell you what, I've always thought these cars looked really cool. But now driving it, I mean, it's it's not you know the most fantastically exciting thing in the world. It's not like driving a proper track orientated traditional mid-engine combustion engine supercar but it is very much an interesting package of technology and that's exactly what I recall thinking about it the first time I experienced the car and I guess what I'm looking forward to finding out about with the McLaren Artura which does this kind of thing as well and I guess a similar type of setup this just did it about four or five years ago One of the things with the gearbox, of course, being the nine speed, you do have a slightly strange sound and feel to the shifting, but first gear is effectively only for pulling away. So when you're driving, even if you effectively decelerate to almost a standstill, you're only going down into second gear, not into first. You can only drop into first when you are completely static, 
to then pull away or to do the launch control, which is quite unusual, but makes sense, I suppose, in terms of the gearing up at the top end, more the long distance general cruising, which it does in a super gentle way. And like I said, it's not a car that I guess you're gonna be screaming about or, or getting really, really excited about. It's just a car that is certainly intriguing in terms of its level of technology and how early it did it and how it offered it at a fairly realistic price point, even considering some of the supercars and things arriving on the market now. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the greatest in terms of the interaction with the shift paddles, but there are some other things as well. For example, the way the steering wheel is shaped and placed, you just see it below the eye line on the scuttle out on the front of the car, which means that you have this great view, again, around you with the thin A-pillars that I talked about earlier. You don't feel that you have any struggle in terms of visibility. Even looking backwards, there's a very nice clear window back there behind us to look over and we'll check out the storage capacity and things as well afterwards. But just to go through some of the corners and little twists that we have just here out onto the highway onto the interstate. I think these were underappreciated. I think this is the underappreciated supercar. I mean, I felt excited about it when I drove it back at the time, and I feel excited driving it again now, even though this car came out in 2016. It was long awaited, yes, people wanted it to arrive five years effectively before that. It took its sweet time to get to market. But I suppose that's because they were making something that would be the perfect package that this is. And maybe I find that an interesting step in terms of cars and shaping the automotive landscape and the future of the automotive landscape, which gives us this that extra little something on top of any of its competitors. One thing that I think is pretty cool is that even after a fair amount of driving so far, we actually still have a full battery. And the last bit of driving, I've been in Sport Plus, I've been enjoying it a little bit, yet the system is all geared up for that. The system is fully primed and prepped to make sure that it does keep up the charge, which is, I suppose, part of the cleverness behind this. Now, this is the thing I was talking about. If I go down into first gear, it doesn't let you. It blinks, keeps it in second until you come to a complete standstill, then you can go down into first. And we will turn across here, watching the front nose through the dip. I'm not quite sure exactly how low it is, but if we take an angle, all is good. And we're basically then back here at Vegas Auto Gallery, where we will head inside. Because like I said, there are some pretty cool things to go and see in the showroom. Bugatti, Pagani, Nani Teen. We'll get inside and go have a look at those in just a moment. For now though, let's pull back up carefully does it through the dips that they always have around here worrying about front splitters but when you're going slowly this is where it's super light it's super easy you can actually go back into quiet and I suspect yeah we're back on EV slightly pretty that's a nice color on the Urus dark blue yeah this is where something like this really excels it's just clever it's just all around clever with the NSX technically still on, we're in quiet and EV mode. You do still need to remember to turn it off, but a few more things about the interior of this. And I think the main way to describe it is that this is really ergonomic. Everything is very easy to reach. All of the controls here in the central console are directly in the arm placement. There's no awkward movements you have to make to be able to press any buttons. Obviously here is where you've got park, reverse, neutral, drive, putting it into manual, the automatic park brake and brake hold buttons and your dynamic selector, very proud in the center. One thing that is a little bit peculiar about this though is the optional cup holder that we have here which actually slides into the passenger side there of the central console and is awkwardly in the way of your passengers legs and knees this is a very strange contraption I think you can just remove it he says it pulls straight on out but yeah I find that a little bit odd to be honest maybe I'll leave it back in place outside of that though everything is very nicely done obviously if I press the throttle it wakes things back up you can see we're still in quiet we've got the digital display here oh as soon as i let go of the throttle it goes back into ev that's very interesting to see as well but you can go through the different modes up into sport plus everything gets red it's not the loudest and craziest sound you know it's a v6 there's a helicopter just right overhead at the moment just flown off behind the building and the new york skyscrapers here in vegas as you do normal things hey anyway let's switch this off climb back on out we've got our memory controls there aren't that many different positions you can have for the seats um, you've got the uh, lumbar here backrest and base not a whole lot of other things down here is the lever to pop open the front we'll go have a quick look at that and then here 
is the button to pop open the trunk and your fuel filler at least as well. Stepping on out, there's a nice mix of materials as well for the fit and finish of this. The carbon roof gleaming in the sunshine. We'll come have a quick look at this power plant back here. The rear deck opens the hatch back there. You've got a lot of carbon fiber, the car's number as well on that plaque. And then that three and a half liter twin turbo V6. Also back here, a small amount of luggage space. You could fit two, I guess, small cases. You've got a weird shape to it though with this central part, all to do with, I guess, the motors and whatnot that's sitting underneath, slightly inconveniencing the amount of space that you do have. But other than that, the uh, rear is all quite clever. And I do like the look through here with the flying buttress. Obviously the air management and airflow that's navigating around that. To come to the front, a bit more cooling with the vents and various bits and pieces. You've got a catch just here, he says, to open this up. No luggage space there though, all consumed by the powertrain bits and pieces that we've got going on. Not entirely sure everything that we're looking at. You can see the cooling, the radiators, and obviously the electric motors running towards each of the, uh, the front wheels, but keeps a short overhang as a result. Clip this back down, give it a click on both sides into place. I do think it's a good looking thing. I'm not the biggest fan of kind of fake vents. This top part is a bit fake. This is open for cooling. This is kind of like a grill, but not a grill. You've got your towing eye cover, your parking distance sensors, some airflow and cooling coming through. Obviously aerodynamics at play with the development of the NSX. Yeah, all around pretty nice, but let's head inside because like I said, there are a few more cars sitting right there that we need to go and check out. Let's come through here then to take a quick look, starting right here with the Audi R8 RWS. They only made 999 of those, the rear wheel drive version of the R8 with the V10. We've got a 488, another R8, a 570 Spider, 911, Evora GT, Boxster GTS, BMW i8, DB11, a couple of other nice cars around, but come on through this way past some really nice garage memorabilia pieces, because around this corner, look at what we've got here, a Pagani Huayra Roadster sitting next to a Bugatti Chiron, next to a Porsche 918 Spyder. Look at all of those. Look at the color schemes as well, the bright white with the satin black with the red interior on the Chiron, the pearl white with the exposed carbon and again the red interior here on this Huayra Roadster, one of 100, one of 500 Chirons, one of 918 918 Spiders. What an epic trio of hypercars here inside the showroom, joining some of the other Lotuses, the Evora GTs, and some cool bits and pieces around as well. Those are very, very nice. But what's fascinating to me is how much that car brings in some of the technology that you find in this at, well, about a, a fifth of the original price tag of the 918, and so probably still to this day, even a more of a smaller fraction of the current market price when compared. But really this was the trio of the Holy Trinity in terms of hybrid supercars or hypercars. This was the most usable with the natural integration of the technology, which the NSX really brings to the supercar segment sitting just beneath that. Just awesome to be here around all of the cars. Well, that more or less brings today to an end then. A great drive in a fascinating car, the Acura or Honda NSX, a car that is quirky in many ways, but that's probably what draws me to it quite so much as something that's just a little bit unusual, but also a forerunner of the technology and direction that many of these things are now going to be heading as we start to see more and more hybrid supercars being launched onto the market, more of this technology that previously was in the hypercars trickling down into supercars and ultimately, I suppose, into your more regular, if we could say that, sports car segment of the market as well. For now then, a big thanks to Vegas Auto Gallery for the opportunity to come down to take this for a drive and to have a look around at some of the hypercars here inside the showroom too. For now though, that is all with the noise of an AMG in the background that I can hear. But yeah, I enjoyed that one a lot. Maybe in the future, that could be one to think about adding to the Shmimobiles. That's it though. Thank you very much for watching guys. As always, I appreciate your support an awful lot and I'll see you again very soon. Cheers.